of San Diego District Attorney's Office to talk about something that's not the most comfortable topic, but it's something that definitely should be on our radar, and which is human trafficking. And really looking, I love the debunking myths and misconceptions because I think there's a lot of that around this topic. Um, I have, you know, had four girls at home um, between the ages of right now 13 and 22. All of them have been approached in some way um, in this manner through social media. And luckily, we have those conversations and we try to catch them, but sometimes not always. Sometimes it looks very innocent and they're trying to, you know, oh, I'm going to meet a friend at the mall. And I thought, meet a friend? Like, who meets a friend at the mall? She said, no, no, it's this girl on social media. She has this profile. And I have to tell you, I created a fake profile so fast so she could see how easy it was to be done. I had a really cool fake profile. It was destiny. I had tattoos and piercings everywhere. It was so fast. And she was shocked at how, in about two minutes, I made an Instagram profile, a Snapchat, and a Facebook, all with this fake, and with fake pictures looking like a fake. And so it was eye-opening to them, but even still, with all those conversations, they were all approached in some way. My sisters work in the hotel industry. They are highly trained to look for any kinds of human trafficking. And so we've been having these conversations with our girls since they were kids, and still they've been approached, and this has happened. So to me, this is such a valuable topic, and I cannot wait to um, for you just to learn more about it. Again, uncomfortable, not our favorite topic, but as parents, especially, you know, parents, I don't want to just say parents of girls because I know it happens with boys as well, but especially with girls, it's definitely something to be watching out for. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Monique Myers. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and it's nice to see some familiar faces from the audience that I've seen here. Um, my name is Monique Myers. I'm a community partnership prosecutor at the San Diego District Police Office. I brought a lot of things. So I'm going to explain to you my things, and then I'm going to give the presentation. So first thing, um, these pieces of paper that are cheap, they're the same thing. One is English, one is Spanish. These are all of the human trafficking resources that exist in the county of San Diego. Every single one. Um, their websites and phone numbers are up to date. Um, there's also information about the red flags of human trafficking. Uh, these are really handy things like, that I made. So please take advantage of this and keep it. It's a really valuable resource. These two green ones, they're the same. One is in English, one is in Spanish. They're about human trafficking. Also has red flags and other resources available and more information about how the trafficking is controlled. We're going to talk about all these things. So this is another resource available. Um, obviously, you have my PowerPoint. I just put up here this handout. Some of you might have had it from other weeks because I've brought it every single time that I've been here. It's one-sided English, one-sided Spanish, but it has a bunch of different resources that are available in the county of San Diego, your trafficking included, but it also has information about domestic violence, uh, opioids, uh, hate crimes. It's a great resource that uh, has all the phone numbers in one place, so feel free to grab that. I just put it up here, though, so you missed it. So come back. I have one more hand up. Oh, I have my business card. And then um, the district attorney's office has a newsletter that we put out in English and in Spanish about important cases. You should be friends that we're seeing in the community, public safety stuff. You don't share your information with anyone. I actually don't even need your name. I just need your email address, and then I can sign you up for it. Or you can email me. It's in my signature line. You can sign yourself up. But this is arguably easier. So if you would like that, feel free to sign up, and I will register you. And then I have one more thing that I forgot in my car, which I'll bring out later, but I will tell you about it. So something that I think is really important that I'm going to talk about first, before I get into human trafficking, is this concept about immigration status. So, this is a lot of words, but so basically it's talking about how the district attorney's office doesn't care about someone's immigration status, documented or undocumented. We want people to feel comfortable reporting to the police and coming to court. We don't ask about anyone's immigration status. Should we learn what someone's immigration status is, we don't share that with anyone. 
We don't talk about it in court, and we don't pass it on to any other federal agency. In essence, we don't care. And it's really important when we're talking about some of these crimes because one of these really affects the immigrant population. So I wanted to make sure that we're talking about this. The district attorney, VA Summer 7, recently came out with a video with Cardinal McElroy from the Catholic Church talking about this. And we created these cards. Um, that's what I had forgotten about. These cards that are in Spanish that say this idea, this message in Spanish. And so that is included in the in the Spanish translation handouts that you receive. But this is the kind of information that I think the community needs to know so they feel comfortable reporting crimes. Now you might be thinking, no, I know someone who reported a crime and it resulted in their information being shared. The law has changed. It's a recent change in the law and it's actually illegal for you to do that. If I were to do that, I personally am committing a crime. Personally, me as a human. If I ask someone about their immigration status in court, they're on the stand and I just bring it up for whatever reason, I've committed a misdemeanor. Uh, so it's not a joke, it's a real thing, and these are real changes to the law that the community doesn't know about, and so that's why I'm, I'm talking about it today. So with that, I'll talk about human trafficking. Today we're going to talk about what is human trafficking, how you can recognize it, we're going to address common misconceptions about human trafficking, and then you're going to learn how to report it. Human trafficking is an umbrella term for labor and sex trafficking. Those are two things under the umbrella of human trafficking. So we're going to talk about both. I'm going to spend the bulk of my time talking about what is sex trafficking, because that is what is affecting youth. But I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about what labor trafficking is. They affect different populations in different ways, so you need to be educated on both. I'm a lawyer, the rumors are true, we love to talk. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand during the course of the presentation. There will be an interactive component to my presentation. I have no problem just calling on people, so please participate so you're not that person. Just kidding. It's a long day, guys. Yes. <laughs> Is uh, sex trafficking include uh, sex work as well? No, well, so we'll talk about the definition of sex trafficking. Sex work, if you believe that they're doing it by their own free agent fruition, then no. I don't believe that there are a lot of people who are doing sex work by their own free agency and have no one else affiliated with that work. I think that that is a rare situation where that's happening. Um, but no, it would not include that if the person is really doing it by their own free will. So what is labor trafficking? Labor trafficking is one per this is the legal definition. So I'm going to give you the legal definition and then I'm going to tell you in English what it means. It's when one person deprives or violates the liberty of another person for forced labor or services. Gobbledygook, right? Like what does that mean? Think slavery. Someone is being forced, tricked, threatened to commit acts of labor. They're working because they're being threatened in some way, or they're getting, uh, feeling the effects of violence in some way. So it's not they're wanting to work, they're being forced to work. A good and easy example of this that's gonna maybe destroy a Disney story for you, and I apologize in advance, but here we are. Are you familiar with the story of Cinderella? La Cenicienta, right? Okay, that story sounds really great. She gets the glass sit with her and she has the castle, right? Like it's really nice. What her life was like before all of that happened was labor trafficking. She's forced to live in terrible conditions. She's not paid. She's not fed well. And she's not allowed to leave. Those are all the definitions of labor trafficking. I know, dark, right, for Disney. But that's a good visual for you. Now, it doesn't always have to be that ex extreme example of someone being forced to live in a dungeon and work it. It could be as simple as um, they're working in a field, they're underpaid, they're living on site of the field, and they're disconnected from the rest of the community, and they're told, you have to do this. And if you don't do this, we'll report you to immigration. That right there would be your definition as well. So here we are. This is that interactive piece. Thumbs up if you think, yes, that's true. Human trafficking and human smuggling are the same thing. And thumbs down if you think, no, they're not. I see some thumbs up and I see some thumbs down. Get comfortable, guys. We're going to do this a couple times. Move on to fingers. Just get ready. Get ready. Okay, so that is a misconception. 
Human trafficking and human smuggling are not the same thing. Now, for those of you that said it was, I don't blame you. Because in the community, they're used interchangeably like they are the same thing. Those people are wrong. What's the difference? Human smuggling is bringing people across the border. It's a crime against a country. It's a crime against the border. Human trafficking does not require movement of a person. It does not require crossing a border, whether that's a state border or a country border. There's no movement required. Human smuggling, crime against a country. Human trafficking, crime against a person. There is a person victim as opposed to a government type of victim. How, yes, ma'am. But that's not to say that some child being crossed illegally across is being trafficked. Right? What do you mean? Well, <clears throat> bringing a child or whomever over um, for the purposes of a forced activity. Right, but it doesn't, what I mean to say is just bringing someone across the border gotcha. in and of itself is not human trafficking. Now, if you're bringing them across the border and there's other things that are happening, then you start checking boxes of other crimes. But just the act of bringing someone across the border, that is not human trafficking. And it's confusing because the word human trafficking sounds like you traffic people, you move people. Um, but that's not what it means in the legal sense. So how big of a problem is this? Big problem. So, San Diego is on the list of top 13 cities that have children that are being exploited for commercial sexual exploitation, according to the FBI. California is on the top four destinations in the United States for human trafficking. Worldwide, this is a problem. This is not, a, this is not just a U.S. problem. This is not just a San Diego problem. This is a worldwide problem. Worldwide, the United Nations estimates that there are 27 million people who are held in slavery on a daily basis. So what's the largest crime? It's drug sales. Illegal drug sales is number one worldwide and here in San Diego County. Number two worldwide is a tie between illegal arms sales, so gun sales, illegal gun sales, and human trafficking. In San Diego, it's drugs, human trafficking, illegal gun sales. So we're consistent, rather consistent with everybody else. It's not a great consistent to be though. So labor trafficking, who is getting trafficked? It happens in a variety of different ways, but primarily it's victims of poverty, refugees, immigrants who are on work visas or overstay work visas, um, ethnic minorities, undocumented, or those lacking education. The way it happens, we'll get into it in a second. Um, this is significantly underreported everywhere, including here in San Diego County. Um, one thing that's interesting, there was a study, and they reviewed 122 cases, and they found that 71% had actually entered the United States legally. They had been lied to, they had been tricked, but they had entered legally into the United States and then overstayed their visa. So labor trafficking, we're going to do the thumbs up, thumbs down thing again. You guys have loosened up, you've, you've practiced, now you're going to be really enthusiastic about it. So thumbs up. It's true. Labor trafficking only happens in shady, illegitimate businesses. Thumbs down. That's not true. It happens all over the place. <clears throat> Nothing gets by you guys. You're right. That's a misconception. It's a huge misconception that exists. So this has to happen in some shady, underworld type of enterprise. So what kinds of businesses do we primarily see labor trafficking in? Generally all of them. Um, but here are some heavy hitters. So maids in private homes, day laborers, uh, agricultural workers, people that work in janitorial services, hotels, motels, health services, elder care facilities, construction, manufacturing, landscaping, restaurants, uh, candy sales and flowers. And one that was surprising to me that I didn't know, but now I'm educated on this, is that also some people are forced to dead on the street. So you can see that there's a wide range of different industries that are impacted by this, and it's not necessarily the shady business, whatever that means to you. Yes, ma'am? How about some of the places, like where they do your nails and things like that? I'm glad that you brought that up. Yes. Uh, beauty places, so hair salons, massage parlors, and nail salons. Yes, there's actually a case in San Diego 
um, that originated out of a nail salon, and the person was identified as a victim because of a customer. A woman who got her nails done there on a regular basis started seeing and noticing things that didn't quite add up, and she reported it. She was correct. There is an overlap, a crossover, between the massage industry and sex trafficking. And we're going to talk about how that crossover happens. So how do they get recruited in the first place? Oftentimes they're recruited in their home country and brought here under false promises of the American dream. Just straight up, it's going to be great. This is a great position. This is a great job. You'll make good money. You can send the money home. It's all legal because you're going to have a visa. This is good. That's what they're sold. They arrive, and it's just not like that. They are working in deplorable conditions. Oh, please tell me if I'm talking too fast. I'm telling you. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, they're working in horrible conditions, whether that's unsanitary, unsafe, uh, or they're living and working on site. And not able to be free to move. So they're sold a dream, and the dream is quickly shattered when they get here. That's one way. Another way is just the recruitment that would happen while they're already here. They're offered a job. So, oops, I think I skipped. I did. Okay, so what are some red flags? What might you see as a regular person in the community that would indicate to you that labor trafficking could be happening? I describe employees living and working on site. They're living in a place they shouldn't be living in. Think it's a nail salon, and they're living in the back of the nail salon. That's weird. right? That's not your normal situation. That's a red flag. You might notice personal belongings, uh, makeshift kitchens, you know, kind of uh, crock pots and weird hot plates and things like that that indicate a makeshift situation. Or rolled up mattresses, air mattresses, yoga mats. Things like that that people might be sleeping on. You might notice a security system that's a little weird. You might notice cameras pointed in the building as opposed to outside the building. Because they're monitoring what everybody's doing on the inside of that building. Making sure they don't leave, making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. You might see locks on the wrong side of the door, on the inside. Keeping the people in the place as opposed to keeping the outside out. Now, these things are just red flags. There might be very legitimate reasons why there's a camera over the cash register, right? There might be a reason for that. Or it could be really weird that there's cameras in the entire place all over the place. It depends on what's going on in the totality of those circumstances. Often victims of labor trafficking don't know their address. Legitimately. They do not know where they are. Because they've been moved around, if imagine farm workers, they're moved from farm to farm, out in the middle of nowhere. They don't speak the language, perhaps, and they don't know where they are, legitimately. Um, they're often threatened and feel unsafe in their environment. And these threats can be complicated threats. You know, there's the immediate threat, I'm gonna hurt you, sir. You are the one I'm gonna hurt. Or, I know everything about your family, and I'm threatening your family back home. And those threats might feel very real to you. They might have few or no personal belongings, so oftentimes the trafficker will take hold of cell phones, uh, passports, ID cards, all of those things under the initial guise of, I'm going to help you go through immigration. We're going to do this together. I'm familiar with the process. I'll help you fill out the forms. And then they just never give them back. And so now this person is in a foreign country without any money, without any personal belongings, without a cell phone. They don't know anyone. And they don't even know where they are. They're stuck. There's often um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and psychological abuse that happens to keep them in that situation. Um, you might see someone always translating for the other person, depending on what industry you work in. You might see that the trafficker or someone is just incredibly helpful and is going to be more than willing to provide translation, and it just doesn't make sense to you. All of these things could be indicative that there's labor trafficking or nothing. Right? You have to look at the totality of what's going on. So why don't they just leave or tell someone? I gave a little bit of insight into that, talking about how they might not speak the language, they have no money, they don't know where they are. Um, please feel free to take photos or whatever you want. Um, but usually, fear of deportation is a really big one. 
Um, they're threatened pretty aggressively about that, as well as harming their loved ones. They might have had bad experiences with law enforcement in the past or in their home country. The organization, because it's an organization of business that's doing this, might be legitimate looking. And so they are told, no one's going to believe you, person who doesn't speak the language and who has overstayed their visa and is basically homeless, versus us, this legitimate company. And so they'll use that. So I'm going to switch over and talk about sex trafficking because I know that that's really what you wanted to talk about, but I really wanted to get this information to you because this is a topic, labor trafficking, that is really not discussed in, in our society, um, even less than uh, sex trafficking. Does anyone have any questions about labor trafficking before I switch? Yes, ma'am. How do you get a, like a... 1-800 number kind of a thing out like to the communities so that they could possibly report anonymously because they just don't want to be identified as the person that's like, you know, well, like for instance, I know there's a lot of areas, especially back areas like in Carlsbad, I used to work with, uh, uh, what is it, by, it's a bilateral collision mm -hmm. and uh, they worked a lot with uh, migrant workers that were forced to be there. Some not, some mm -hmm. were in uh, like the Carlsbad area, Fallbrook area. Is there like active interaction with those communities to stop that? There's an attempt, but as you can imagine, I'm not welcome. If it's a trafficker organization, they're not super keen on like the DA's office coming in and doing a presentation on labor trafficking. Right. So there is an effort to get information out into the community, but really rely on presentations like this and people like you to pass this on because you get to go places that they're not going to invite. And this might come as a shock to you. Not always the most beloved person in the room, especially um, if there's criminal activity happening. Right. So you're able to hand out flyers and information and provide someone you know who's in the situation with resources in a way that I might not be able to have that touch point with them. And so the information that you've been given today has all those numbers of how you can report crimes and things like that. And we'll talk about it. Um, yes, you can make those reports anonymously. Um, there are significant drawbacks by making those reports anonymously, and I'll tell you a key one. If there are any follow-up questions because you didn't provide enough information, they won't be able to make that follow-up. And that can make a really big difference. Yeah. Another point that I, I, I think about would be, um, granted, let's assume that you know someone who is getting their labor, you know, their labor traffic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very common in California, especially with like up north in the farms or now cannabis farms, right? Um, if you get them out of that situation where they might be making, I don't know, nothing compared to what they would be if they were even had minimum wage, what happens to them? Are they going to get deported? Do they stay here? Um, because granted, their conditions are probably going to be terrible. They're living in a you know a campsite practically. Um, I'm assuming that the person who employs them, or you know, for lack of a better word, also feeds right. them and houses them, which is probably more than they would be given by the state. So there are various. Not, so you bring up a great point. This is really a see something, say something type of presentation, not a see something and try to rescue. Because what you just described is very real. Um, the needs are complex. And as a regular person, you're not equipped to provide those resources, right? You're not equipped to provide housing, mental health, health care, um, PTSD training, you know, like all that stuff. You're not ready to do that. But there are nonprofits that are in the community that do provide those types of wraparound services. And so by working with an agency like that, you ensure that that person is actually going to be in a good position. If you were to just pull this person out yourself, unless you're prepared, and you're not equipped to, but unless you're prepared to really own all aspects of that person's life, you're going to be doing some harm along the way. Because they're going to have a lot of stuff. There's going to be a lot of baggage that you're not equipped to deal with. That's especially true with sex trafficking. Um, you brought up the question about well, what's going to happen to them if they get pulled out of this and maybe they've overstayed or didn't have a visa in the first place. There are various programs with the federal government. There's a U visa, for example. There's a T visa. There's, there's various visas that exist that if they're truly the victim of a crime and they come forward and talk about it, there are ways to stay in the country that way. 
um, through the government. Yes. I speak Spanish, so if you want to just ask your question. No, 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 it's so oh. good. Sorry. Thank you. Um, yo los pagos, si quieres preguntar, te pregunta. No, se fregó. Oh, gracias, se fregó. <laughs> Um, uh, so there are ways to, um, in collaboration with the government, to get a legal status health care. Uh, any other? Yes, sir. Random question. Nowadays, how old do students have to be to be able to work? I honestly have no idea. Because no. um, that necessarily, I, yeah, I have no idea. But I bet you the school does know. Yeah. So there are work permits that can start at 14 and what? However, the hours are very restricted at 14, which is why a lot of places will hire 14. It's like, I think it's two hours a day, um, not on school nights, you know, that kind of thing. So, and I know there are special permits for entertainers and, and that, but that's... I guess my question goes more towards seeing people in a random place that maybe they shouldn't be at a certain hour, yeah. like at night. Yeah. That's all I'm going to Oh, yeah. So, labor trafficking primarily is immigrant-based. Usually, it doesn't have to be, but that's usually who's being exploited because the fears are usually related to deportation. That's the common threat that we see. Um, kids being out and about when they shouldn't be is kind of what you're talking about, working where they shouldn't be. Um, depending on your city, there might be restrictions on when kids are allowed to be out and about, and there is curfew basically for underage kids. Um, you can always pass that information on to law enforcement. Uh, the reality is, you never know what's going on and if your information is useful or not. Just because you're never going to be told, like, oh, that was really helpful. There were runaway they were missing. So great, glad you called. Right? They're not going to share that with you. Um, so that information can be passed on to them. It doesn't necessarily mean it's labor trafficking, but it might be something else. So switching gears to sex trafficking, are we ready? Sex trafficking is very similar. So legal definition: a person deprives or violates the personal liberty of another person to have the victim engage in commercial sexual acts or pornography. Basically, a person through force, fraud, fear, violence, coercion, trickery, is forcing another person to engage in pornography or commercial sexual activity. That's an adult, that's 18 plus. What about minors under 18 years old? No force is required. It's just one person attempting or causing to get the minor to engage in commercial sexual activity. So commercial sexual activity is any sex act for anything of value. We often think of sex for cash, sex for money, but it doesn't actually have to be cash or money. It can be anything of value. That means drugs, rent, clothing, food, any sort of thing of value would meet that definition. Uh, no force is required because children can't consent to this type of thing. So what you'll notice in this definition is that it doesn't require someone to move, right? We, we talked about the difference between human trafficking and human smuggling. No movement is required. So a minor could be um, approached virtually and asked to engage in pornography virtually and never leave their bedroom, right? There is no movement of any kind that happened there. So someone could be born in San Diego, Raised in San Diego, never leave San Diego City, and trafficked in San Diego. There's no movement that's required. We're going to talk about some terms that you might hear. Some of them are legal terms, and some of them are terms that are used on the street. Pimp, pimping is actually a legal term. It's also used on the street. So what is a pimp? Pimp is used very casually in colloquial language, right? Um, it's like cool. They pimped out their car, right? It's a cool term. Uh, person is a pimp if they know another person is a prostituted person and they benefit in some way from the proceeds from prostitution and they know that that money is coming from prostitution. So what's an example? Um, a pimp knows that Samantha is working as a prostitute and worked that night and had cash and then Samantha pays for dinner. That is pimping. They're he is benefiting in some part from the proceeds of the prostitution. It's that simple. This is the traditional hierarchy that we see. Um, we're gonna talk about the different roles. So I talked about the pimp there at the top of the organization. I'm gonna talk about it in terms of business terms so that it's easier to understand, but the pimp would be the CEO or the founder of the company. The bottom is like your upper management. 
your wife or wifeys are your low-level employees. Those bottom and wife or wifey is a term used on the street. And I'm going to explain what they are because often the term bottom, that person, that role, is not discussed at all in movies or in music. And most people don't realize that person, which is a particular concern for kids. So who is the bottom? I put a lot of slide information that I normally don't present this way, but this way it's out in your printout and you don't have to take notes. So the bottom is in a higher ranked status than the rest of the people working for them. I'm going to use female uh, pronouns for the victims and male pronouns for the pimps, but it's really important to know that it can be either. Uh, there are male and female victims, there are male and female um, pimps, but for the sake of consistency, I'm going to use female pronouns for the victims. So the bottom in this situation is a victim themselves and a perpetrator. They're in the middle. They're the manager. What do they do? They provide a buffer between the pimp and the wife or wifeys, those other victims. They actively recruit. This is why it's important to know this person exists. They're female, and they actively recruit other victims. So oftentimes when we think of human trafficking, people, parents are on the lookout for that boyfriend or that guy. The pimp is a guy in that stereotype. And they don't realize that the bottom might come in as a trusted friend, a trusted female friend, who's just as dangerous and just as violent as the pimp, because they serve the role of enforcer as well. They enforce the roles of the, of the pimp through violence, um, through psychological trauma. They serve as a buffer to protect the pimp from law enforcement and from having to deal with all the stuff that is going on with the white piece. They're the manager, right? They're protecting the CEO of the organization from all of those issues. The wife or wifey, that's a term that's used amongst themselves. Um, so they refer to themselves often as a family or a team, because it's us against the world sort of mentality. And so they refer to themselves as wife or wifeys, going along with that family environment. That it's us versus them. We're here to take care of you, unlike your parents at home, unlike your family, unlike your neighbors. We got you. And so they start using words like that, which psychologically start creating that environment of trust and stability in this uh, environment. You'll notice on the slide, there's also pimps call this group a stable. We're going to talk about that. And you might think, oh, like horses? Yes. Uh, they are referencing the wife or wifeys as you would describe your property, your cattle. And they treat them like that, their property. So what's the difference between pimping, pandering, and sex trafficking? You might have heard of pimping. I gave you the definition. You might have heard just in your life about pandering. Pandering is when someone recruits another person to become a prostituted person, a recruiter, for lack of a better word. So if a person pimps or panders a minor, so they not only benefit from prostitution proceeds or they recruit a minor to engage in prostitution or pornography, it's almost always the crime of sex trafficking. If a person pimps or panders an adult, and then they add the element of force, fraud, or fear, now we're in the world of it's pimping and pandering, but it's also sex trafficking. So pimping and pandering are two crimes, and sex trafficking is the boosted level because it includes the element of force, fraud, fear, or coercion. Now, I don't believe that someone is being pimped or pandered without force, fraud, fear, or coercion. But proving force, fraud, fear, and coercion can be challenging because oftentimes you need cooperation from victims to explain the force, fraud, fear, or coercion that happened versus text messages, voice messages, and things like that can help show pimping or pandering. Yes? The panders in this little hierarchy that you have, could that fit into being the person that's bottom? Yes, and so um, the bottom is often doing both. They're benefiting from the proceeds and they're out there recruiting people. They're a big recruiter because they can fly under the radar because they look like a trusted friend. Um, if it's a female, it's a female thing. They look like a trusted friend. They might be the same age or slightly older. And so it's the guard is down. It's not a dude making moves on you. It's a person who's trying to be your friend. It's not a big deal. 
Uh, and so, yes, that's why I was saying how the bottom is often a victim and a perpetrator. They themselves are being exploited. They're not living a great life. Their life might be a little bit better than the wife or wifeies because they're in a higher position. But they're usually put in that position because they either have a long-standing relationship with the pimp, they have a trust of some kind, they've earned the trust, or just through the relationship they have that trust, or they've proved themselves in some way. But they themselves are living the same life. They often are made examples of as well and beaten as well. Here are some other terms that you might hear. I'm sharing these terms with you because they're terms that you might not recognize, but you might see them. Um, let's talk people first. The pimp is often referred to as daddy or the boyfriend. That's part of that familial or family once everybody else in life. Um, we talked about stable, teen, and wifey already. Trick is the sex buyer. Um, we haven't talked about the sex buyer. There is a significant demand, and that is what drives, in my opinion, this entire operation. If no one was out there purchasing, then you wouldn't be selling. Right? It's a simple two-sided system. Um, I worked in South Bay several years ago. I was here for four years. For three of those years, I provided legal advice to law enforcement agencies here in South Bay on demand operations. Um, and I can tell you that when advertisements were posted, sex advertisements were posted, the cell phone that was tied to it would be constantly ringing and constantly receiving text messages from different jobs, different tricks, different sex buyers. It was overwhelming. You could not respond to all of them if you wanted to. It was physically impossible. We tried, but it was physically impossible. Uh, and they came from all walks of life. And what I mean by that is all types of professions. I'm talking high-ranking people at tech companies, to doctors, to people in the military, to mechanics, to construction workers, where everybody in between was purchasing sex. And they were buying it, and they had families, some of them, some of them didn't, some of them had wedding rings on, some of them didn't. Um, you know, all, all walks of life, all socioeconomic walks of life, all ethnic backgrounds were purchasing sex. And so it's really important to understand that, yeah. Do people in poverty buy sex a lot? Like, do people who don't have a stable income, are they able, like, do they purchase sex? Homeless people, for example? Oh, so there is, a, yes. So um, I talked about how sex in exchange for anything of value. And so can you imagine uh, drugs, food, clothing, shelter are all of value? Uh, often on the street, it's called survival sex. And so you use what you can to survive. And so, yes, there is a whole economy that operates with sex as a currency. Um, these operations, these people had jobs for the most part that I saw. Um, but yes, there is a whole culture that happens like what you just described. Yes, ma'am? Was it mostly males? Yes. It was mostly male sex buyers, um, but it's important to appreciate that there are male victims, and they really underreport. And they really underreport because there's a strong stigma against them coming forward. There's a strong stigma for victims, male, female, of human trafficking to come forward. Uh, so much so that um, oftentimes it, it presents as domestic violence. There's less stigma coming forward with domestic violence than sex trafficking. And so they have a romantic relationship, oftentimes have a romantic relationship with the trafficker and are more comfortable presenting as a domestic violence victim because they are getting uh, abused than saying that they're a sex trafficking victim. Um, but yes. Yeah. There's a lot of sex trafficking in truck stops. Is there, I don't know. Do they try to do something to stop that? It just like, it's like, there's a lot of sex trafficking in a lot of places that are not truck stops. I will tell you that all of the operations that I was involved with were not at truck stops. Um, they were in regular neighborhoods. Um, but there are efforts that are being done both by law enforcement, not specifically for truck stops, but there are there's actually a 
focuses against trafficking nonprofit that provides training for traffickers on how to identify victims of human trafficking and to change that culture. Um, but in general, it's an equal opportunity uh, thing, not necessarily unique to the truck stop area. Um, but the remote location, the it's usually dark, there aren't a lot of people around, helps allow that to happen. Um, phrases that describe the locations, physical locations are the track, the people who are participating in this will say they're working, the blade, the whole thing is called the life of the game, and they say that they go on dates with the sex buyers. Um, and we already talked about pimping, prostitution, and pandering. Those are the legal terms, but they're also used on the street. Right now, though, those locations are all physical locations, like, out in the world. There's been a significant increase in um, commercial sexual activity in hotels and motels and private homes. So misperception, well, I already did this one, I already did it. Sex traffickers are always female and victims are, sorry, sex traffickers are always male and victims are always female is not true. But I already told you, so we're not going to play. Uh -huh. So there was a study that was done in 2015 by Point Loma Nazarene University and University of San Diego. And it, it was looking at the extent to which gangs are involved in sex trafficking in San Diego. This is the most comprehensive study that we have about what we're seeing here in our county specifically. So I'm going to share with you some of the information because I think it's useful for parents to know this. Because some of it's surprising. At least I found it surprising. So who are the victims? Um, I know the photo is kind of small. But one thing that's of note is that you can see 80% were born in the United States. There's a common misperception that the reason we have a, a human trafficking issue here in San Diego County has to do with the Mexican border. Um, but the reality is that it's a, the victims are born here, primarily born in the United States, for sex trafficking. Um, and then you can see the breakdown of the different ethnicities of the victims that they did in this study. Uh, and you can see that uh, there's no group that's excluded from this. I'll let you take that photo. Thank you. No problem. Okay, sorry. Uh -huh. So who are the victims? They analyzed all the victims. They talked to all the players in this, from counselors to prosecutors to detectives to public defendants. Uh, so they found that 97% were female. But uh, as I said, I really caution that because boys just really under report to the extent that the district attorney's office is doing a campaign right now specifically targeting boys on educating the community on this. 30% um, of the traffickers, they call them facilitators in the study, so I use the word facilitator on the slide, but 30% of the traffickers witnessed or participated in sex trafficking at school, at schools. And that's in San Diego County. They also reached out to 20 different school districts about uh, a representative of the county and asked them two questions. One, do you have confirmed cases of human trafficking at school? And two, do you have suspected cases? 100% uh, suspected and 90% had confirmed. The average age in the study, and like I said, this is 2015, the average age was 16. Pre-COVID, it was 15, 16, so it gone down a little bit. During COVID, it went down a lot. And the Human Trafficking Task Force actually rescued people as young as 13. COVID was rough for kids for a lot of reasons, as you know your parents. But in the world of human trafficking, these kids were online a lot and rather unsupervised. And so they were more easily groomed and exploited online. Also, they weren't going to school. And at school, teachers are mandated reporters who see things and then are forced by law, mandated, to pass that information along and report it. But they weren't seeing the kids, so the reports went down. What went up, though, was the calls for child pornography. And that makes sense that those two are related. They also found that this was happening in all parts of the county. Um, the cases were all over the place. So what are some risk factors? Some of these are not going to be surprising to you, but the one that I think is really important to highlight is age. So middle school and high school students, that, that's a major risk factor. Just age, just age alone. Additional risk factors, and this are factors. It doesn't mean that if this box is checked, it's definitely going to happen. Or if the box is not checked, it's not going to happen. But uh, children who were runaways, were involved in foster care or homeless are at a higher risk. Um, we talked a lot about uh, survival sex, 
And that makes sense now, right? 90% uh, had experienced some form of abuse or neglect. They were living in poverty, had low self-esteem, had experienced sad childhood sexual abuse, or developmental delay. But then again, just age alone is a factor. So misconception or fact. The most common way sex trafficking victims are brought into this life is by being kidnapped, drugged, or restrained. Thumbs up, yep, that's true. And no, that's not true. What do you guys think? That's not true. That is how the media portrays it. That is how the movies portray it. So you might be thinking, I saw the movie, take it. And I see some of you are nodding and laughing. So that might happen, but that is not what we see here in San Diego. That is not what we see in our cases. We see a different thing that happens as a slower, more methodical approach, which I'll talk about. But first, who are these traffickers? According to the study, and just based on my personal experience, it's pretty much anyone who's in their life could be a trafficker. So there is generational trafficking, moms and dads trafficking their own children, uh, boyfriends and girlfriends, which is common, and we'll talk about it, traffic, their significant other, uh, classmates, friends, strangers, babysitters, and gangs are very involved in human trafficking. So the study looked at uh, gang involvement in human trafficking, and so this is kind of what they found. They found that 85% of the traffickers were gang involved. 110 different gangs in San Diego were involved with human trafficking. A trafficker earned an average of $670,000 a year. Yeah. Uh, and that is an $810 million underground economy here in San Diego County. Um, you can see the ethnicities of the different gangs on the slide. According to the study, um, we do think that it is a larger underground economy now than it was at the time of the study. So where do they recruit teens? Where is this going down? How is this happening? So the study found that basically, it's a list of places, but basically it's places where teenagers go. It's uh, the mall, the schools, parks, parties, public transit locations. Church youth group jumps out at me specifically as a surprise, um, and social media. Social media now is the primary recruitment that we're seeing. So how do they do it? Whether it's in person or it's online, it's done in a very similar way. The Romeo Charmer is the main way of recruitment. It's not the only way, but it's the main way. So. Imagine you're 15, and you meet this guy, again, or girl, and it's like the best boyfriend ever. Remember, you're 15. Feelings are hard and fast, and you're in love. This person is going to change your life, because they're going to promise you stuff. White picket fence, if that's what you want, move out to another place, because that's what you want, whatever it is. They might buy you things along the way. Cool clothes, manicure, stuff, whatever that is. You don't have a cool whatever, they're going to make you have a cool whatever. It can be as simple or as complicated as that person needs. They're filling an emotional void as well. So they're going to be the best friend, trusted confidant, um, most important person in their life. And it's going to be the best relationship ever until it's not. At some point, the boyfriend is going to say that they're out of money, they need money. If they don't get this money, the dream that has been created is going to break. It's desperate times. Can you do this thing one time for me? I heard it from a friend or something like that, and it's have sex for money, I know a guy. And it's not a big deal, you and I have sex, it's fine. Um, just this one time. And maybe they say yes, and away we go. And they, the trafficker knows this is not a one-time thing. This is the beginning of a lot of things. Or perhaps the person says, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm not doing it. They'll impose pressure. They might use violence, and that might lead to the domestic violence that I was talking about. They might identify more as a domestic violence victim because of the beginning of the violence. One way or another, it's going to happen. So it might be that nude photographs have been sent back and forth between them during the course of their relationship, and now there's blackmail material that can be used. Um, you know, if you don't do this, I'm going to show your parents this. I'm going to show your church, your grandma, whatever. Yes, sir? In your experience, San Diego County, 
how, what percentage is it like this? Like, is it really happy to be here? This is what I've seen. I teach. So we say this, I know somebody, I know somebody. And sometimes I want to be more specific, like I can document it because this is what the data shows. So is this really how it happens? Because I feel that sometimes our, in my case, students don't believe me. This is what I've seen. It can happen to them. So I've seen this. This is actually the only thing I've seen. Um, as the initial buy-in to how it started. It's this. Um, actually, no, that's a lot. I've also seen the best friend recruitment into the life. But this is the main, the main thing. And they tend to be at 16, 17, like you said, or is that very, or does that depend on your um, so human trafficking affects all ages. Um, so there, there are older people who are in it and younger people. But 15, 16 is like the right age for it. Um, it doesn't have to be this way. There are other ways in which someone might get recruited. There's another really common one that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but this charming, flattery person, this great boyfriend, is the really common way. Um, and it's a very naive thing that happens because they believe that this truly is like their soulmate. Um, and so we see even after the cases are being prosecuted, even after we're going forward, they're still putting money on the traffickers' books in custody. They're still sending them money. They're still working on the street for them at their direction. So um, it, there's a big psychological connection that happens between the group. And this is an intro to it. Um, it's an easy recruitment because the team falls in love and believes they're going to run away and have this amazing life together. I thought your hand was up for a second. Uh, is this data only on gangs? That study specifically? Yes. The study was specifically looking at gang involvement, but um, the information I provided about victims is not specifically to gangs. So what they did as part of the study is that was their focus. That's what they wanted to analyze. And they accumulated other data along the way. What they did is they went and talked with um, pimps who are in custody, uh, victims, uh, service providers, law enforcement. Like they interviewed a lot of people and uh, accumulated the data through that process. So they were looking to analyze gangs, but in doing that, they provide a lot of other information. So I talked about the violent trafficker, and that's often done through um, blackmail. That's one way. Or just straight threats. This is the other common thing that we see specifically amongst youth. We would call him the CEO of trafficker, but I would describe it more in layman's terms as like, hey, baby, I'll make you famous. So it is the trafficker that's promising, I'll make you a famous model, actress, movie star, YouTuber, whatever. And they're going to use the contacts to make that happen. They are an agent, the friend is an agent. Oftentimes you see the bottom as um, you're really pretty and um, my boyfriend is a photographer and he's taking photos of me to do modeling things and like we shoot it together and loop them in this way. And then they show up to what will appear to be a legitimate photo shoot, but it will quickly turn into uh, demands for nude photographs. Uh, and then that allows blackmail. Or sex fortune. So online grooming is uh, incredibly prevalent, and they'll present as a trusted peer, peer. So a lot of times there's this perception that there's like a person who's pretending to be somebody else, and they're online, and they're actually like an 80 year old man masquerading to be a 15 year old girl or a 15 year old boy. That's one aspect, but oftentimes they're actually just themselves presented as themselves. They're the cool older boyfriend or the cool girl who has what appears to be an, an amazing life, and they actually are that age-ish, um, but everything that they're saying is, is a lot. So it's not necessarily a 50-year-old man pretending to be a 16-year-old boy. That can happen, but it could also just be a 16-year-old boy coming forward as a 16-year-old boy. But what they want to do is schedule... Um, meetings and meet up online. They also want to send photographs back and forth, inappropriate photographs, but they're really trying to isolate the youth from their friends, family, and activities. Because once you start doing that, you start sabotaging those relationships, they gain a level of 
um, elevated status with that person, right? They have control now. They can start doing the whole, your family doesn't understand you the way I understand you. Your family doesn't treat you well the way I treat you. Those types of things to start the brainwashing. So I know that we're over time, so I, I will be quick, but, um, but I'm not going to cut it out. So here we go. <laughs> Possible red flags of human trafficking. Um, we're going to talk about tattoos. They might have uh, unexplained injuries, STDs, or bruises. The one thing that you can really look out for as a parent, though, are unexplained luxuries. They have stuff, whatever that means, that you did not buy. And they don't have money to buy it themselves. So who bought that for them? They have jeans that you didn't buy. How did they buy those jeans? They got a manicure. How did they pay for that? They're using Uber. It's not on your credit card. How did they pay for that? Um, things like that might seem innocuous. It might be a totally legitimate thing. Or it could be a sign of human trafficking. Or something else around. Um, they might have multiple cell phones. Uh, one would be the one that's like the family phone, and then one is the phone that was provided by the trafficker to do trafficking business. Uh, they might not know where they are. Traffickers often move victims around to different cities. They literally do a circuit. So they're in San Diego, they go to Las Vegas, they go to Fresno, they go to San Francisco, they go to LA, and then they're back in San Diego. And repeat. Why do they do that? Uh, helps with evading law enforcement. If you're constantly moving, law enforcement starts an investigation, and then you're poof, you're gone. And so it delays investigations. Also, sex buyers pay a premium for new in town, fresh meat, things like that. They can get higher prices for new people in town because the sex buyers are often monitoring who's in town and are looking for who's new. And so they're incentivized financially to move around as well. Uh, they might have an older boyfriend or they might call their boyfriend daddy. Um, they might be very anxious and depressed and fearful and constantly tied to their cell phone or looking to another person to answer for them. So they might have to check with the boyfriend to see if they can do something regularly because that person is actually controlling them. Um, they might have multiple hotel keys, receipts, condoms. They might be missing school uh, or ditching school. For that reason, it's important that youth themselves are aware of what human trafficking is because a best friend or a good friend is going to identify some of these things long before a parent or trusted adult might notice some of these things. Please don't take photos of any of these slides. These are slides of real victims and traffickers in our cases. Um, the handout that you have, I deleted the photos, and that's out of respect to these victims. These are real tattoos that are on their bodies. You'll notice MOB. And that stands for money over bitches. And that's because the victims are considered trash. They're nothing, they're property. You'll see a uh, hundred dollar bills are very common. Um, you'll also see on the fingers there's a crown. Crowns are very common because the pimp is the king. Tattoos on victims are called branding. Just like uh, a farmer would brand cattle to make sure that everybody knows that that cow belongs to them. They do the same thing with victims. So you'll notice um, uh, middle of the page, it says Team Tip. I think there's a crown there too. I talked to you about how they refer to the, the group as a team. Tip is the moniker for the trafficker. So she's on his team. It's loud and proud on her back. So anyone who sees her knows she belongs to the trafficker Tip. It serves a couple of purposes. It attracts other traffickers from trying to recruit her. They have to pay to buy her from him because she is property. Um, and it's psychologically very damaging to her because she now sees every time she looks in the mirror that she belongs to someone else. You'll see a barcode on the back of that girl's neck. Um, the bottom, you'll see initials DLA and a crown. That's because those are the initials of the trafficker. He's the king. Uh, loyalty is a very common thing. You'll see the girl in the right-hand corner has loyalty. It's a fresh tattoo across her face. Um, Dave B's moneymaker, $100 bills are really common. Um, but the idea that their property, I think, is really enforced by the tattoo um, on the left, where it says I, I blocked out her name, but imagine I, person's name, 
I was the property of Sugar Shaft. Um, I think it says anyone who comes in contact with me is in debt to him. That's on her body permanently. So these are real tattoos that are on victims, and it's branding. Um, and this is once they're in life, uh, they'll get these tattoos. These tattoos also serve as a deterrent for getting out of the life. Because imagine you go home, everybody sees this. So now everybody knows what's been going on in your life. And so that psychologically is also a deterrent um, because of the negative stigma associated with human trafficking. So misperception of that. Victims of human trafficking often see themselves as victims and as being exploited. Yes or no? No. Most victims do not. Uh, most victims do not view themselves as victims at all. Uh, and will continue to refer to their trafficker as their boyfriend. So why don't they just leave? Uh, well, I described the, they're in love with the trafficker, right? It's a domestic violence type of relationship. They're in love with this person. Um, the trafficker has also usually instructed them that law enforcement can't be trusted because prostitution is a crime, it's a misdemeanor, and so they are going to get arrested or in trouble. Um, we're not in the business of doing that, but that is the law. Uh, the trafficker can often threaten to hurt their friends or family. And remember, they're often the boyfriend or they've gotten close to them, so they know all the people that they actually care about. They lack resources. So while they have been working on the street, having sex for money, they don't keep the money. The trafficker has all of the money. So they're in a position of not having any resources to actually leave. They can't pay for the bus. They can't. Um, get a hotel room. They can't do anything unless the trafficker agrees to doing it. Oftentimes, they don't even pick their own clothing. Uh, they have a lack of marketable skills, and they know it. Um, so oftentimes, they drop out of school, they have gaps in the resume, and they think, how am I going to get a job? Like, I can't just walk in and get a job. Uh, they might have low self-esteem. They often do. Um, when we see very intense jail calls between traffickers and the victims, the trafficker builds them up, you're amazing, I love you, and then I need you to do X, Y, and Z. If you don't, blah, 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 you're horrible, terrible, this is all you're worth, and then they just hang up after like a screaming match. And they're crying, and then they'll call back like five minutes later, and everything's fine, and I love you, and of course I'll put my name in the books, and of course I'll do this, and of course I'll do that, um, because it's that cycle of the psychological abuse. Uh, we talked about the stigma and the shame. And then also remember, they're often isolated and away from home. They might not be in their home city. They might be somewhere else that they're not familiar with and have no means of getting home. So interacting with victims. You think that someone is the victim of human trafficking. You've taken this training. You believe you are now engaging with someone who might be the victim of human trafficking. Now what? Basically, you take nothing away from this training. It's a you see something, you say something, and treat them with dignity and respect along the way. Um, if you make them feel safe and you establish trust and you ask open-ended questions and you're not judgmental, you call who you believe to be the trafficker, the boyfriend, because they call them the boyfriend, you're using all of the terms that they're using because that's what you're supposed to be doing. What are you accomplishing? You're making it so that that person sees that other people respect them and trust them so that they might feel a little bit more comfortable reporting or getting help. Because there's so much psychological harm that happens with trafficking, they're often basically told to trash, that if you give them dignity and respect, it might be something they haven't had in a long time. If you offer them choice, that might be the first choice they've had in months. Because they didn't pick their clothes, they don't pick when they sleep, they don't pick when they eat, they don't pick what they eat. So it might be the first choice that they have. Yes? How does the state view uh, like, uh, prostitution as a crime versus a uh, victim of sex trafficking? So prostitution is a misdemeanor under the California Penal Code. Um, but, so technically it's a misdemeanor, that would be a crime. Um, but here in San Diego County, the idea is really just to provide them with resources and help to get out of the way. So even if they are arrested for prostitution, the process is more connecting them with resources to try to get them out of the way. And you're like, well, why are they being arrested in the first place? There is no way to offer them services otherwise. There is no way to intervene otherwise. Um, law enforcement can't 
give services out like that. They can, but no one's going to take them. Um, so if a victim of human trafficking um, or sex worker, as you described earlier, is contacted by law enforcement and they are cited um, for prostitution, they're going to be offered services. Is there fines or any other financial implications when you're arrested? So when someone gets arrested, um, this is a misdemeanor, so it has a fine and um, jail time as a possible exposure. But if a criminal case is filed against them, then they'll get offered services for a dismissal. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah no, I was trying to work through mentally the uh, both things, right? The idea that they're a victim, but they also have to pay a fine, and how that can play into... Maybe but they don't have to pay a fine. Well, they so don't if they get charged criminally so that they could have resources, if they choose that. Yeah. Gotcha. That's, sorry, it was a little complicated. Yeah, sorry. Um, what's important to not do? So you're like, 100%, this dude is not a boyfriend, that's a pimp. You keep that to yourself. Why? Because you're in a see something, say something situation. I will tell you exactly what harm you can cause in a second. Um, so you're not asking, is that your pen? Are you a prostitute? Are you being trafficked? Even if all those things are totally 100% true and you're an expert on this, you don't ask that. You don't say that you should get out, you deserve better, any of that. You're just a normal person talking to another normal person. Why do you not say that? It's dangerous for you and it's really dangerous for them. It's physically dangerous for them. But it also likely will shut down possible law enforcement investigations in the future. And I'll tell you why. Okay, we did that. So trafficking, there's big money in trafficking. There's a lot of money in trafficking. There's a lot of violence in trafficking. So let me give you a scenario. You go up to these two girls, and you're like, this ain't right. I know what I know, and I listen to Monique, and I remember everything she said because she was super smart, and these girls are definitely being trafficked. Cool. Great. So you go up to them, and you go, hey, you see there's no one else around. You go, hey, do you guys need help? And you feel pretty good about yourself. You're like, I identified this problem, and I'm going to be helpful. I'll call the police if they want me to. I'm here for them. You don't know what role they're playing in this organization. Who is the bottom in this photo? Do you know? The answer is no, because it's a stock photo from Shutterfly. So, but uh, the answer is there's no way to tell. And so what happens? You go up to these two girls and you say, do you need help? And then one of them goes, Oh, uh, no, no, we're good, we're good. And you walk away because they said no. And you go about your life. And you don't think twice about this. Well, the bottom didn't like the way that the other person responded to that question and didn't think it was believable. Because there was a, a hesitation at the beginning. So what do you think now happens? She's going to get beat up. If not more. Definitely going to be that. Are there sexual consequences that also happen with that? There could be. And it might seem like an innocuous question of harmless, right? Do you need help? But not in this situation. You just put her life at risk. You didn't realize it, but you did. And so that's why it's a see something, say something situation. What if she had said yes? I need shelter right now. My pimp is around the corner. Let's go. We're, we're going on a mad dash into the parking lot. We're putting them in your car, right? Like, we're not prepared for what's about to happen. So, if you do see something that you think is suspicious, there are various avenues in which you can report it. If you or someone else is in immediate danger, it's a 911 situation all day. It's not a hotline, it's a 911. There's the National Trafficking Hotline, the Child Abuse Hotline, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children Hotline. These are great resources. But this is not immediate law enforcement intervention. This is a, you report it, they pass it on to another agency, and then they investigate it. So if you need law enforcement today, right now, that's 911. 
this is my contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out. Uh, does anyone have any questions though before I close? I know we're over. Yes. Idealmente sí, legalmente. Oh, should I do this in English or not? Okay. Um, legally, um, middle school and high school are required by California Education Code to provide human trafficking education to students. It's an unfunded mandate. My understanding is an unfunded mandate without a lot of guidance on what that curriculum may or may not be. Um, we are asked, the district attorney's office is asked to do presentations for various high schools, uh, and we will do them, we're free, um, but it should be included as part of the curriculum at school, at some level, and it should be done at various grade levels. It's not a one-time presentation, check the box, and now you're educated and you're good to go. Um, the reason for that is, I gave you a ton of information. When you go home, you're going to remember a fraction of it. And in four weeks, you're going to remember maybe even less. You're going to remember the thing that was shocking to you, or the thing that was surprising to you, or something funny that I said. Um, and so it's important that kids get it over and over and over again, because they'll learn more things every single time. Yes? Are they still doing the napkins or the in the cards? So I get asked about that as a thing. And I was just going to say that she asked it for those of you who didn't get it, napkins and zip ties left on vehicles. Um, there's a lot of stuff on social media, TikTok, Instagram about human trafficking that is not quite representative of what we see in our cases. That's usually very scary. Um, and it's kind of like clickbait, but the visual version, because um, they're usually videos. Um, so I have not seen that. The only reason I asked it was a quick bit. It was a police officer, I believe, in Dallas, Texas, um, who had like a long time as to precautions. She has a daughter herself that's like seven, I believe, mm -hmm. and so she does these shorts uh, in regards. And one of the things, so I don't know, maybe that's a thing that's happening. Maybe on. there, um, yeah. but I, um, I will tell you that I presented last week with someone on the human trafficking task force, and then I talked to him this morning about. Anything that you think we should do differently, this is the slide presentation that we used, and he said no. Um, and I've never heard here. here about that. I've seen it, I know what you're talking about, but I've never seen it in, in my life. One more question. Um, like escort businesses, uh, they're legal, right? They're I'm sorry, legal. I can't hear. Escort businesses? Oh, escort businesses, yeah, okay, so escort businesses. They cross over to prostitution. Yeah, escort businesses, I don't think that's a real thing. Yes, escort businesses are you pay someone to accompany you to a dinner, right? You're paying them $500 to have a young lady perhaps accompany another person to a dinner, but it's technically legal. Um, I think a lot of prostitution and human trafficking is happening under the guise of escort business. And I say, I think, I know that a lot of uh, Sex trafficking is happening under the guise of that because that is how the online advertisements for sex are being done to evade law enforcement detection. Right? It's a legal thing. I'm offering you a massage. We, we, you know, it's it's real, but they use other. They don't use one link. They use other uh, code to indicate that it's it's not quite what it appears. Uh, and so there's a lot of escort advertisements that also include keywords that are indicative of sexual activity is going to happen on this experience. So they use coded language. But they can't be shut down because of that, right? Because so it can't be shut down because it is happening on a third party website and there's nothing illegal about an escort, correct? But if you believe that it is not really that because they're using all the keywords, the code words to indicate it, um, that's partially how Backpage was shut down. Um, Backpage was like a Craigslist, but it was pretty much just sex trafficking. Um, so the shutting down of social networking sites and online platforms is very complicated because a lot of them aren't actually based in the United States. And so you don't have jurisdiction to do anything. I was just hoping I could see your 20, slide 28. I couldn't catch the percentages because the colors don't show up here. Oh, okay. 
Thank you. Percentages of what? I don't know the number. Of the victims? Okay. Gang? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Or the gangs? Or yeah, right there. The victims. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to write that. Yeah, no problem. Does anyone have any other questions? As a parent, when when you look at the about our daughters, what we can say to them, what I don't know. Yeah, I think it's important I and mean, you know, I don't have I don't have kids like that. But um, I think it's important to have the conversation to establish that line of communication and trust and non-judgmental stuff. Because Sometimes kids get in too deep. We've seen this in our cases. They get in a little too deep. And then they try to fix it by themselves. The person starts pressuring them for new photographs. They sent them. And now they're ashamed of what's going to happen next. And yeah, the sending of the new photographs, not great. But there are things that we can do to cut it off in the past, as opposed to now it leads to blackmail and other activities. We've seen cases like that, where the kid is too ashamed to tell Trust me, though. And so they go on this journey, um, terrified that these photos will get released. And the journey that they go on is of sex trafficking, and it's much worse than if the new photographs had gotten out. But in their mind, they're trying to fix it and protect mom and dad. Uh, and so I think having those conversations that, like, no matter what happens, I'm here for you and proving it can really establish that trust so that when something weird happens online or they make a mistake, that they can come and talk to you and feel safe to do that. Um, and that level of, of trust, too, when it comes to social media, because you can say no social media for you. But some kids do have two accounts. They have the account that mom's aware of and the account that mom's not aware of. Um, and so they're starting to hide behaviors. So let's say... What's the, like, age to get a restraining order? I don't know. Is it only, like, 15, 16? Is there... So it depends on what's happening okay. um, and what crazy means. Because um, just because you don't like him, you can't get a restraining order. But certain types of stalking-like behavior, threats, things like that, that's a different, that's a crime, and that can lead to restraining orders. But just, I think he's a bad influence, and I don't like him, he's not going to make it. No, something like what you were telling us, like, yeah, so then if you, um, like, you think online grooming is happening, um, then that's worth reporting to the police because the reality is that there's probably online grooming happening for other people as well. Um, and there might be an investigation going on that you just don't know about. And so oftentimes what happens is people feel hesitant to call the police because they're like, well, what I saw is like, I don't know. And like, I don't want to get involved. And I don't know. So like, I, you know, who am I to do Um... We really have to stop that um, because we don't know what's important and what might help somebody else. Um, and so you don't know. Yeah, that girl is being trafficked, and they've been trying to find her, and you found her, right? So I had a case where a victim of human trafficking. I came across her when she was 18, um, but she'd been rescued as a juvenile multiple times, and she got rescued because. People would call that a suspicious, it was suspicious that an underage girl was doing certain things. And that's how they found her. Um, what she was doing at the time was not illegal. At that exact moment when she was contacted, the police was not illegal. But someone just felt it wasn't okay. She shouldn't be here. She shouldn't be dressed like that. She shouldn't be here. Why is this person doing this? Nothing was illegal, obviously. But it was relevant to other things that law enforcement did. Um, and we have a really strong culture of, I don't want to get involved and like let other people do other people things. And I think that per perpetuates a lot of these issues. Thank you.